Okay, Jim, go away at as and fall to fly who August go away of as a veil and then a mark show a new maratalog mark a gym and a project that and chat the one of Bryn or Lori Tihi act the coach and fan. Thanks everyone for for being here. As as Jim said, we're here to discuss a very topical and very important um, issue with. I suppose one of the leading uh, housing uh, activists um, and authorities uh, on the issue uh, of housing and what's facing people, uh, not just across the 26 counties, but nationally uh, as well. As you all know, Owen's no stranger to Belfast or to Fela. He's now uh, has the great privilege of uh, serving in the Dáil as a TD, but previously served in the Dome of Delight in Belfast City Council um, for, I can't remember, it was in North Belfast, I just can't remember which constituency. Old Park. Owen, Old Park. So not an easy one uh, at the time, but as you know, Owen's no stranger, as I say, to, to feel he's a regular contributor, and like yourselves, I, I'm looking forward to asking him a, a number of questions today and, and hearing his views um, on this important topic. If it's okay with yourselves, we're going to go for about 40 minutes um, and then I'm going to give the floor over to yourselves, hopefully for the last 20 minutes, for questions uh, and answers. And hopefully that should give us a good um, opportunity to tease out the issues. But if we're waning on a bit, I'll maybe rely on you to come in a wee bit uh, earlier. So, Owen, um, no. firstly, the question I want to ask you is... The event we're marking here today, the event we're hosting here today is Housing a Human Right. Is that a statement or is that a question? Depends on who you ask. Um, well, first of all, look, it's really nice to be here. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I don't get up to Belfast enough. I suppose in the context of the South at the minute, there's a very live debate as to uh, whether there should be a referendum to enshrine the right to housing in the state's constitution. Um, the constitution as it stands kind of delineates political rights, kind of the structure of, of the state in terms of its decision making. And there's been a debate for quite some time as to whether we should enshrine social, economic and cultural rights uh, into that constitution. Uh, in 2014, there was a very important constitutional convention. One of the things about the government at that time is if there were tricky questions that they didn't want to deal with themselves, they threw them into a convention, thinking that that would kind of make them go away. And in fact, what was really interesting about the conventions is when you put a bunch of representative ordinary people in a room with or without politicians, they can come up with some really, really interesting conclusions. So 2014, the Constitutional Convention of 100 people, 66 randomly selected but representative citizens and then a bunch of politicians, looked at this issue of social, economic and cultural rights. They listened to experts in favour of such a thing, against such a thing. Uh, 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 and at the centrepiece, they had a, a debate between Michael McDool. People might remember him as a former Attorney General and Minister for Justice and all-round bad guy in Southern Irish politics. Um, <laughs> and a really wonderful woman called Dr Mary Murphy, uh, who for her sins and nobody's perfect, was a Labour Party councillor for Finglas, but is actually one of the country's leading social policy experts and uh, uh, was a member of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. And they had this debate about the merits or demerits of placing uh, uh, rights such as the right to housing in the Constitution. And at the end of that debate, there was a vote. And astonishingly, or maybe not, 84% of the convention's members said, yes, we should enshrine social, economic and cultural rights, the right to housing, the right to health care, uh, uh, language and cultural recognition of the constitution. Of course, that created a problem because with such an overwhelming mandate, what's the government going to do? I mean, this is a government at the time uh, uh, that's led by Fine Gael with the support of Labour. Uh, there was no way in hell they were going to uh, take that up and hold a referendum. And there it lay for a number of years. There was then an election in 2016, uh, and it took quite a long time to form that government. It was a kind of an interregnum of a bunch of months. So Sinn Féin had tabled a motion uh, to the Dáil to set up a subcommittee of the Dáil to look at what was then the emerging kind of housing and homelessness crisis. Cross-party, uh, uh, um, uh, very detailed piece of work. One of the only issues we couldn't get agreement on was whether or not we should recommend holding a referendum to enshrine the right to housing in the Constitution. All of the progressive uh, uh, members of that Dole committee voted for it, but Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael were against it. So the only compromise we could get is that the incoming Oireachtas should ask its housing committee uh, uh, to explore the issue. I, I had the privilege of being elected to that Dole and being on that housing committee, uh, and the government blocked us considering the very thing that uh, we had asked it to do. And it eventually had kicked the issue into the finance committee. And for folks who don't understand the significance of that, if you ask the people looking after the money, mm -hmm. should we enshrine social and economic rights into the constitution, by and large, they won't agree to do it. They'll be too worried about the pounds, shilling and pence. 
uh, and then in the most recent uh, uh, program for government between Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green Party, the Green Party really wanted a referendum on the right to housing. Fine Gael were absolutely against it and Fianna Fáil were just desperate for a deal. They didn't care about it either way. So we got this very bizarre phrase in the program for government saying we'd have a refer referendum on housing. We didn't know what that meant. Of course, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael still couldn't agree. Um, and then Fianna Fáil did uh, what they always do, which is they created another vehicle to consider a thing that had already been considered uh, called the Housing Commission. Uh, and they've just concluded a report, which isn't published yet, um, uh, by a significant majority, recommending not only that the government hold a referendum to enshrine the right to housing in the constitution, but they've recommended putting it in the most important part of the constitution where it would have real legal effect, and they've recommended a wording. Um, and we're now waiting to see what the outcome of that is. Fianna Fáil, who were traditionally against it, have shifted position and they're now in favour of it. Fine Gael are still against it. Uh, 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 and I suspect what might happen is, because I don't think they're going to be able to agree, they might ask another group of people to consider what the Housing Commission considered uh, and what uh, our previous committee and what the Convention considered. But there's a growing sense that enshrining the right to housing in the Constitution would be a very, very important step. Um, it, it doesn't guarantee everybody the right to a free home. There won't be a queue around a block at the Department of Housing the day after such a referendum, people looking for their keys. That's not what a right to housing does. Uh, nor will it lead, in, in most experts' views, to a proliferation of litigation against the state. Because generally speaking, when you have either a legal or a constitutional right, it places an obligation on the state, but it's not an obligation that can be, uh, um, uh, 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 I suppose, litigated immediately. But when we were discussing this matter recently, we had a, a, a very eminent, an Irish guy, um, Professor of Constitutional and Human Rights Law University College, London, called Colm O'Kanaja. People don't know Colm, he's really, really good, and you should check his work out. But what's really interesting about Colm is not only he's an expert in constitutional and human rights law, he used to be against social and economic rights being uh, 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 legalised in that way. But having studied it he, in theory and in practice, he's come to the view after about 20 or 30 years that actually it does something very important. Uh, and in recent testimony to our Oireachtas Committee, um, he said, there's two kind of consequences of doing this. Uh, and this is relevant here as well as in the South, because it doesn't have to be a constitutional right. It can just be a legal right. In the South, it's better if it's a constitutional right. Is The first is it has a political impact. It creates an expectation that government is now going to do something it wasn't going to do before. Uh, uh, if you have a minister who wants to do something, that minister, he or she, can point to the legal or constitutional right as justification to move the uh, uh, institutions of the state. And that that in itself can kind of create a reforming dynamic. It doesn't guarantee it, but it creates an opportunity for it that can shift the political and administrative uh, apparatus of the state. And it also does create a legal opportunity, whereby if the state is egregiously failing to vindicate that right in, in the most extreme cases, that people can have recourse to the courts to have that right vindicated, something that's very, uh, very important. Colm O'Connor told our committee at the end of, of his testimony that he thinks those two things have a catalytic impact. And where he studied it, not in all cases, because there are some jurisdictions where housing uh, 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 rights and housing access got worse after the right was enshrined rather than before. But on balance, he, he believes that it is a good thing. Is it a silver bullet? No, it's not. Mm. Does it solve a housing crisis overnight? Of course it doesn't. But is it an important tool in the toolbox uh, for activists, for uh, progressive elected politicians and for uh, citizens and residents to try and go from a situation of acute housing need and inequality to a situation where the state is actively, progressively mm. trying to secure people's access to secure, appropriate, affordable accommodation? Uh, absolutely. And it's on that basis that we're very keen that the government publishes the report, talks to the opposition about the wording of the referendum, talks to civil society, and then sets a date for the first quarter of next year to then let the people decide uh, if they want the housing status quo or if they want to enshrine the right to secure affordable and appropriate accommodation, accommodation in the uh, constitution. And my view is, not unlike the citizens, uh, the constitutional convention, if we give the people that choice, uh, and if we go out and debate in an informed and intelligent way, uh, mm. I think that people will support such a proposition. You uh, you asked yourself a series of questions there that I was going to ask you, <laughs> so you've sort of done me out cunning, of it. Cunning, cunning plan. But, but uh, 
I suppose, and, and I'm looking to some of our friends and comrades in the Irish language community and, and, and activism who know very well that rights being enshrined in a constitution or down on paper in a legal framework doesn't necessarily um, mean implementation or mean action uh, as a result. So uh, I suppose that teasing out that issue of the philosophical versus the practical, I mean, you spoke, uh, I suppose, importantly about a willing minister. Um, if you get to the point where there is uh, a constitutional uh, guarantee uh, of a right to housing, and then that's coupled with, hopefully next time around, a willing housing minister, what does that look like? Because you spoke quite a bit on there, I think, to be fair, about what it wouldn't mean. But what, what would it mean? What would it look like um, in terms of housing as a right enshrined in the Constitution in an ideal situation? But how does that play out in the context of the economic conditions and crisis and emergency that people are waiting housing are currently facing? So what the, the, the kind of legal experts who, who study this area, they don't just study the legal theory, they also look at what happens when you enshrine these kinds of rights in law and constitution. So they also live in the real world and many of them are also housing activists and, and, and political activists. The way they describe it is, is a legal right to housing places an obligation on the state to progressively realise the right to housing uh, and in my preference to secure appropriate and affordable housing. Uh, through its policies, its legislation, its budgets. It places that obligation. What that means, first of all, uh, and I remember having a conversation with Patricia King, folks who are old enough in the room will know who Patricia King is, but she was a, a lifelong trade unionist and she was the head of the Irish Congress of Trade Union uh, for, for many years uh, and obviously had to do battle with government uh, politicians and civil servants. And the reason why she thought the right to housing was very important is because whenever you have a minister that wants to make change, the civil service always have a list of reasons why that's not possible, right? It's just, it's their natural instinct, kind of, even if they're not against what you're proposing. So having that right, where a minister is able to say, well, actually, we now have this new obligation. The state has to, under the terms of the constitution, progressively vindicate this right. That in of itself will be enormously helpful. So that's, I suppose, issue one. The second thing is it creates an expectation, and expectations in politics are important, because if people have an expectation that something's going to happen, uh, uh, politicians feed off that, uh, uh, and it's very difficult for politicians to mitigate uh, or, or rail against that without negative electoral consequences. And therefore, even politicians who aren't ideologically committed to housing as a human right in the way that I would be, it, it can have that catalytic effect. But it is also justiciable. Uh, and it's not that we want uh, huge amounts of litigation against the state. In fact, the best outcome of having a, a, a legal or constitutional right to housing would be there would be no need for litigation. But it creates that opportunity and therefore, if you have a situation where a, a family of four or five with a special needs child are spending four years in emergency accommodation and the state is not making clear and reasonable efforts to provide that family with appropriate, secure and affordable accommodation, then if all else fails, the courts can then intervene. And while the courts can't and won't tell the state how to vindicate that family's right. The court could intervene and say the state has an obligation, then get off your backside and do it. So I suppose in, in real practical terms, that's what it does. But be very clear, none of us who are advocates of the, the constitutional right to housing, there's a great organization that says called the Mercy Law Center, but people don't know Mercy Law, they've done three really outstanding reports on, on right to housing in the domestic and international context. Um, there's some really good legal scholars, Pori Kenna in Galway uh, 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 as well. Um, we have two really great professors of constitutional law, uh, um, Rachel Kenny and David, I certainly will come back to me, in, in Trinity at the minute, two really super bright people. What they'll tell you is it's just one bit, right? Mm. And it's one bit, but you need a bunch of other bits, right? You need money, because you're not going to tackle the housing crisis without access to uh, uh, finance. You need the right policies. Uh, because you can have all the rights enshrined in law and all the money, but if you pursue the wrong kinds of housing policies. Uh, you need civil society. You need a mobilised, active citizenry uh, 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 and population. Uh, it doesn't matter who's in government. You need people putting pressure and holding the government's feet to the fire. But you also need progressive politicians in that government. Uh, and therefore, is it a panacea? Will it fix everything on its own? Of course not. Nobody says that. But it's one of the crucial bits of that architecture. And that's why if uh, the government doesn't take up the Housing Commission's recommendation, um, uh, and if that recommendation is strong enough, 
if we form the next government, within the first year of government, we will take that uh, uh, recommendation and we'll put it to the people. OK, I, I'm going to try and move it slightly off that issue of, of rights, but with, without being glib, and I hope this doesn't sound glib, I, I suppose what, what came to my mind there when, when you were talking was what, what use is a right to housing without the houses? So uh, is is this, you know, how do you, how do you deal with this issue separately from the need to deal with the housing uh, emergency? And again, without being too glib, Owen, how do you solve the housing crisis? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, my, we easy one. My, myself and, and Mal McCann, the Irish news photographer, we're, we're working on a, a book at the moment, which is looking at Dublin Corporation's public house building programme from the mid-30s to the mid-40s. Uh, it was an incredibly important period in uh, 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 kind of the history of housing politics in the South. And I always think if you want to try and fix a problem, the first thing you need to ask is, well, was there ever a period in our own history where we did better than we do now, right, as well as looking at international examples? And the mid-30s is really important because the Free State was only a decade old, uh, recovering still from the trauma of the War of Independence and Civil War. Uh, you were about to enter into and then come out of uh, uh, the Second World War and all of the impacts that would have on supply chains and materials and inflation and workforce. Uh, Dublin City, in comparison to Belfast, Glasgow and London, had the worst and the deepest uh, tenement problem uh, of all of what had previously been uh, the cities of that part of the old British Empire. Um, and coming to the Free State Government from 22 to, to 31 had kind of dabbled its toe a little bit in public housing but didn't really get too involved. And some really interesting things happened in the early to mid-30s. Fianna Fáil took power in part on an agenda of change uh, and decided they were going to house the working classes. A really incredible architect, uh, 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 an Englishman who fought in... in uh, uh, the First World War, then became an architect in Liverpool and then came to work in Dublin, was appointed the city's housing architect. Uh, you'd had significant mobilisation uh, uh, in, in communities around the lack of, uh, of proper housing. And at a time when the state was broke, when the state had limited capacity in terms of a history of governance, where communities were living under a level of poverty and housing inequality that we can only read about and, and look at books. In a 10-year period, Dublin Corporation cleared the majority of the slums, not all of them, but slums continued into the 60s and early 70s. They cleared the majority of the slums and they created housing for Dublin's uh, working classes, inner city flat complexes and uh, 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 suburban uh, 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 garden uh, villages that transformed the lives of not just the generation who moved in, but their children and people like me, because that's where my grandparents came from. Uh, and the book is a little bit of the history. It's a little bit of the lessons from then, but it's a lot of interviews with people who live in those buildings, because I always think you can have all of the politicians and architects and housing managers on platforms talk about housing. The people who actually have the most interesting things to say about public housing and the people who live in that housing. So the book is primarily around that. Uh, and we interviewed this incredible woman, Eileen Delamere, 97 years old, right? Um, incredibly sprightly, sharp woman. And she was born in a tenement on Townsend Street. And most people probably won't know Townsend Street, but you know where Trinity College is, and it's just at the back of Trinity College, right? It was dense uh, urban tenements, five storeys, 10 rooms, uh, 10 families, over 100 people, one toilet out the backyard with no uh, roof, just unimaginable housing inequality. Uh, a, a family of eight or nine watched one of the early Herbert Sims flat complexes being built. Family moved in. She then got married, moved back to the tenement across the road. And then she got married and moved into the second block. And she's lived there her entire life since then, right? First on the third floor and then on the ground floor. Raised her kids there. They all now live local and their grandkids are all doing very well. Husband passed away. And I asked her when we were doing the interview, I was saying, do you remember the first day you moved in? And I tell people this story because it's important when we think about housing, we don't just think about bricks and mortar. We, th we think about the people who live in them, right? <coughs> and it was almost like it was yesterday. Her eyes just lit up, right? It was remarkable. And she was like, oh, Owen, she said. She said, I had my own hot water. She said, we had our own cookers. She said, we had our own rooms. She said, it was luxury. And this is an estate that had pretty rough times in the 80s and early 90s. People who know it 
entrenched unemployment, heroin, uh, 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 tough times, but also a very strong sense of community. You might have seen during COVID some of those great YouTube videos of the inner city flat complexes that have that lovely deck access and they were doing the COVID bingo, particularly for the pensioners and, and all that stuff. Eileen's was, was one of those. And at the end of the interview, but an hour long conversation with her and her daughter who grew up there, who now lives up the road in a private house. And I said, I said, Eileen, to people who don't know this place, I said, what would you say to them if they just came in? And she said, oh, and she said, if I won the lottery tomorrow, she said, I wouldn't live anywhere else. And of all the people I interview in these flat complexes, bar one or two, who probably because of issues of, of entrenched drug crime, none of them want to leave. They want stuff done differently. They want st stuff fixed. They want stuff improved. Uh, uh, but those projects created not just a sense of stability and security for those individual families, but a sense of community. So to answer your question directly, how do you fix the housing crisis? It is as straightforward as it was then. You need good legislation that sets out a framework for the state to intervene to build very, very large volumes of non-market homes, uh, uh, of public homes, whether by local authorities, housing co-ops, approved housing bodies, or a mixture of all three. You fund the agencies of local government to be able to build those homes. You decide the number of homes that you want to build on the basis of need. You count the number of households that need those. And then year on year on year, you go at it like uh, 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 you can. Uh, and Herbert Sims and his team built, in about a decade, 17,000 public homes. Now, that might not sound like a huge number, but Dublin was a much smaller city back then, right? Uh, at the high point in one year, they built 1,500. Compare that to the 250 Dublin City Council built last year, and our city is much bigger. So it really is as straightforward as, and this is a luxury we have in the south, that folks here in the north don't have, because the institutional framework between Westminster and the Assembly is different. But you need the right minister and the right legislation. You need a commitment to build really large volumes of public housing. Uh, you need a local government administration equipped, empowered, uh, 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 and willing to do it. Uh, and then you need communities organised and mobilised to make sure that happens. And the good news is, unlike the 30s and 40s, the South is a really wealthy state. And th there is no shortage of funds, either through exchequer revenue, through low interest government borrowing, or other opportunities. There is no shortage of public land. Some local authorities don't have enough, but there's public land in other agencies. Mm. There's no lack of public will. In fact, one of the really interesting things about the housing crisis in the South in recent years is that it has moved from just being the crisis of very low-income families to a much wider range of people. Uh, and it does look like the next general election is going to be one of those tipping points where, among a number of other issues, housing is going to be one of the deciding factors. So if the 1930s was that tipping point, I think we're at a comparable point in history with some new challenges like climate change we can talk about. But it is about the legislation, the budget, the need, and then the delivery vehicle. Uh, and I'm absolutely convinced, and, and, and like I've been a housing activist since I was first elected in, in Old Park, because housing was the number one electoral issue for us in the constituency back then in, in 2001. When I was elected in, in Clondalk and to the council, housing was the number one issue. Uh, since I've been elected to the Dáil through two terms, it has been the number one issue. And I do think we're at a kind of a turning point whereby if we learn the lessons from our past, if we look at the good stuff that's happening in other cities and other parts of the world, and then if we realise civil society, a, a, an organised, mobilised public, combined with progressive politicians uh, 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 and a, a good civil service, can drive a level of change in housing, not just comparable to but greater than what happened in the 30s and 40s. So that's how you do it. It's not easy, mm. but nor is it insurmountable. Housing crises are created by bad policies and bad politicians uh, uh, and bad practices. And therefore, good policies, good politicians and good practices can turn that round and transform it. I think we're going to finish on, on this. If, if you don't mind, then we'll, we'll open it up to, to the floor. I, ho I hope I'm not asking you to give away any secrets, but I'm not taking anything for granted. You've spoke about the, the sort of demand for change in high housing and, and, and the housing crisis has played such a fundamental role in that political shift and societal shift. I mean, I suppose I want to put a, 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 a kind of hypothetical scenario to you based on what you've said in your last contribution and all of them before that. There is a huge degree of expectation uh, around Sinn Féin and government, the issue of housing and dealing with the housing crisis. So 
you, for example, go into the Department of Housing. Politicians are obsessed with the first 100 days. Based on everything that you've said there in terms of how the, the, the broader issue is solved, what would be Sinn Féin and Owen O'Brien's main priorities in terms of uh, addressing this issue and addressing it with the urgency that's required? So first of all, if you wait for the first 100 days, you're losing. Um, and that's our experience of, of a number of governments. So the first thing is, over the course of the autumn, we're going to be refreshing and then republishing not a set of policy proposals, but an actual housing plan. What we would do week one, month one, 100 days, year one, right to year five, if we're in government. We're going to be setting out uh, not just a set of objectives, but actually the del delivery mechanism mechanisms in terms of how we can do that. Because increasingly, governments in the South are being judged on housing. Um, uh, and so it should be. Uh, and if Sinn Féin does get a mandate to form a government and does lead a government, and if we do get the Ministry for Housing, we should be judged by exactly the same criteria as I judged Darrell O'Brien or Owen Murphy or Simon Coveney when they were ministers on the floor of the Dáil, which is a number of very sim 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 simple metrics. Is homelessness increasing or decreasing? Are the supply of social, affordable rental and affordable purchase homes increasing or decreasing? Are house prices increasing or decreasing? Is the level of housing inequality increasing or decreasing? They're all measurable things. They're all things that we can count and see. And therefore, uh, 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 we will live or die by what we do on that. In the first 100 days, um, I'm not going to go through it all because it's not that it's a secret, but we haven't agreed it all yet. But there's a couple of very straightforward things. We estimate that the South needs about 50,000 new homes a year. Current government plan says they need 30,000 new homes. We reckon, and not just Sinn Féin, pretty much everybody else, from the centre-right to the centre-left economists, from the housing NGOs, from uh, uh, other commentators, we need about 50,000 new homes a year. Half of those have to be non-market homes. They have to be public homes, uh, 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 not-for-profit homes. So within, uh, I'm hoping, less than 100 days, having consulted with the local authorities, we'll set out a five-year plan with very, very clear targets for every local authority in terms of the number uh, of social affordable rental and affordable purchase homes that will be produced each year over those five years. We're also going to have a very ambitious plan uh, uh, to year-on-year -year dramatically reduce the number of people, uh, single people and families with children in emergency accommodation. Uh, and while we haven't agreed this final bit yet, uh, I'm of the view that we should set a target of ending long-term homelessness and the need to sleep rough within the first five years. That, that, that hasn't been agreed by the party. Uh, that doesn't mean people won't become homeless. It doesn't mean that people won't lose their homes. But long-term homelessness, anything more than six months, uh, and the need to sleep rough uh, uh, should be ended. Uh, but we need to have metrics. There's no point having an end point if you're not saying there are currently about 6,000 single people in emergency accommodation, about 1,700 families in emergency accommodation. You then have to set out year on year, how is that going to reduce? Uh, uh, what are the actual targets and metrics? Uh, so I suppose a lot of that first 100 days is going to be about formalising and finalising and then publishing that. And that's the first thing. The second thing is announce the date for the referendum if it hasn't happened, right? Um, I'm not going to say we do it in the first 100 days because that will depend on, the, on when the election falls, right? Because you don't, don't want to fight a referendum campaign in the depths of winter. You want it at a time when it's more conducive, when students can vote uh, uh, and uh, others. And then the other thing is because this is really important in our debates around housing. We talk a lot about the numbers, right? Either the total number of homes or we talk about the number of social homes and affordable homes. We talk about the right to housing. Increasingly, we're also having a conversation about adequacy. What does it mean to have adequate housing? Right? Mm. Because that's just as important. And adequate housing doesn't just mean space, doesn't just mean light. It means accessibility. It means the cultural appropriateness of it. Mm. Uh, it, it means housing through the life cycle from youth to parentage uh, uh, to retirement. Um, uh, and it also means uh, uh, the energy efficiency and the climate resilience of the homes as well. And therefore, we're spending a lot of time at the moment really trying to pin down as a government, as a party that could be in government, what do we actually mean by appropriate, adequate housing? What are the metrics and how are you going to deliver that? Because far too much of the debate here and across the water in, in England, and I follow the debates there, is about the total quantum of houses. It's about supply. Folks, it's not about supply on its own. It's about the right kind of supply in the right place, producing the right kinds of homes for people based on, for me, those three core principles, security, adequacy and affordability uh, and therefore I suppose that first hundred days a lot of it is going to be about finalizing uh, 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 publishing uh, 
uh, uh, the, the finer grain of the plan, the annual measurables of the plan, and then setting the date for the referendum. And um, I'm just going to ask you and be greedy and ask you this this last final quick question because you you, you touched on it there, and it's an interesting point. I, I think, what does, in your opinion, own that housing look like? Is it city centre living based? Is it the sort of vast swathes of estates that we've seen in the past? Is it a, a culmination of all of that and more that maybe we haven't experienced across Ireland, north or south, in terms of house building. There is a huge, there's chronic pressure, as we know, on the city core uh, in Dublin. I don't know if there's an availability of public land there. Lots of people would love the opportunity to live in a safe and, and prosperous and clean Dublin city centre. And there are obviously issues in, in rural communities as well. So I'm just wondering, how, and I know you have a keen interest in, in design and architecture too, are we looking at, uh, as well as looking to what we've done historically, are you thinking of new innovative designs, you know, proliferation that maybe people wouldn't have, have encountered before? And then I'll open it up to the floor. And, and this is where the other really important bit of the housing debate has to be inserted. And again, it doesn't get talked about enough, which is climate, right? Because if we want 50,000 new homes a year, uh, uh, we can't build those homes in the same places and with the same construction methodologies as we've been doing for the last 50 years uh, uh, or we're going to burn the planet into uh, a very dark future. Uh, and therefore, questions around what type of homes, what kind of settlement patterns and what kind of locations are inextricably linked, not just with social economic need, but with climate uh, and with uh, emissions reductions. So the first thing is two settlement patterns are going to have to become a thing of the past. Suburban sprawl and unregulated rural ribbon development. Th those, those things are not sustainable. They're not socially sustainable, they're not economically sustainable, and they're not sustainable from a climate point of view. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to live in multi-storey high rises in your urban centres, mm. right? That's not the choice. So the cities that are doing this best, particularly cities that are, say, comparable to, to somewhere like Dublin, they're mid-rise, high density, mixed use. They're four, five, six, seven stories. They mix architectural topologies that give very, very large numbers of residents their door uh, uh, directly onto the street. They use forms of, of urban planning that are about streets and communities. Um, uh, but they're denser, much, much denser than what we have today. Uh, 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 and their planning codes are determined not by what investors require uh, uh, to make a return for their investors over a, a period of time, but what's good urban sustainable planning, right? Something that none of us are very good at in any of our cities on this island, if you ask my opinion. What that then means is in your provincial towns and villages, actually, if you look at depopulation in the south over the last 10 or 20 years, it's in the urban core that people are moving out of. Like the greatest levels of depopulation are inside the canals in Dublin, inside the core of, of Cork and some of our urban centres. So it's about finding innovative and effective ways to repopulate those urban cores. And a lot of that is, is going to be mid-rise, infill, uh, reuse and conversion of, of non-residential into residential buildings. And in fact, that would also be a significant solution to some of our urban dereliction, urban crime, uh, 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 and public services. And then in rural areas, because people need to live in rural Ireland, mm. right? People need to continue to live, particularly in those parts of the, what I call the, the, the Western Midlands and the Western Seaboard, where there's also rural depopulation. And we're going to have to go back to where we came from originally, which is clusters. Like settlement patterns pre the 60s and 70s in rural Ireland were around small clusters because that's how people shared infrastructure, shared uh, 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 amenities and, and facilities. So I think it's about people understanding, first of all, the settlement patterns have to change and then the building materials have to change. We've got to stop building with high carbon concrete. Good news is low carbon concrete is the same price. Um, secondly, we have to stop building with concrete as much as we do. Good news is we've lots and lots of timber and timber building technologies uh, have reached a stage now where they're, they're as good and as safe and fire resistant if it's done uh, properly. The third is we have to stop demolishing stuff. The most sustainable building is the building that's already there, right? Uh, which means we have to change our planning code to make it much more difficult for buildings to be demolished. I go around other cities and they don't just keep existing buildings. They do all sorts of innovative things in terms of adding to them and extending them and, and whatever else. So it's about changing the building materials, it's about greater reuse and recycling. Um, and that is going to lead to some levels of change. People are nervous when I talk about 15 or 20 metre timber-based 
residential blocks, right? But I can take you today to Helsinki, to London, to Krakow, to Barcelona, a wonderful project. If people are interested in this stuff, Google The Guardian and Laborda, B-O-R-D-A. It's a wonderful award-winning um, cooperative housing project in, in Barcelona, 32 apartments. It's almost a 80% timber building. It has an energy rating to die for. Uh, uh, it costs a third less of what a standard build would be, and it's much, much affordable than anything else anybody can uh, uh, rent of a new build in Barcelona at the moment. That's the future of our urban areas. Uh, and then our rural areas, it's back to the things we used to do well, but again with the change of building materials. Good morning, Owen. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open, so I don't think we need a, a, a microphone. If you're okay, I'm going to take two or three at a time. I'm going to cluster the questions. So this gentleman at the front, this young man in the black T-shirt, and then mm -hmm. yourself at the front. So go ahead, go ahead yourself, sir. Thank you very much. That's very interesting observations here. Can you tell me, please, down south, what is an affordable house and how much does it cost? Okay, thank you. Michelle, go ahead. If Sinn Féin were to put into power tomorrow and these plans were put together, these housing plans, and the crisis was so-called solved, in another 80 to 90 years, 90 years, there could be another crisis. And in between that time, dozens more crises. <laughs> And there'll be even more excuses. There'll be bad politicians, bad policies. There'll be war. Just look at the rise of fascism in Europe at the moment. There'll always be these excuses. There'll be economic crashes, economic booms. Meanwhile, the capitalist class will keep on getting richer and richer while the workers stay poor. Until the root problem, the capitalist class being in power, is addressed, then housing or any other right will ever be a right. And these rights will never be realized. Uh, it's from and yourself. Um, well, I was just wanted to ask you around the, you know, proposed legislation about um, co-housing hmm. as an innovative it meets all those kind of criteria you were talking about community-led housing. Um, what kind of policies are needed to support that um, idea that that actually addresses almost like an intermediate yep. market, but creates sustainable clusters and you know all that kind of. Um, yep. Over to you. Okay. Uh, all good questions. So, th this is the first question that has to be asked because the big confusion I decided in a minute is people keep talking about affordable housing. The government passed the Affordable Housing Act with no definition of affordable, right? Um, uh, and if you want to crack the affordability crisis, that is the point you start at. So, for me, <clears throat> there are two metrics. So, for people who rent, affordability is between 10 and 30% of their net disposable income, depending where they are on the income ladder. So if you're in the middle of the income ladder, 30% is about right. But as you then move down the income ladder, 30% is too high, and it then needs to move down towards about 10%. In the South, our social housing rental structures is different to the North. We have a thing called differential rent, where your council rent is a percentage of your household income. It's a really nice system introduced in the 30s. So in my local authority, for example, your council rent is 10% of the disposable income of the household. Um, uh, some of the local authorities have a slightly higher, the city council about 15%, but for very low-income families, that's a pretty uh, uh, fair system. The problem with that, of course, is it doesn't generate, generate enough rent to manage and maintain the stock in the short or the long term. Uh, and then, generally speaking, the SRI has a good definition of affordability for rent, which is for you know, average above average income workers, 30% plus being left with sufficient income for an average basket of goods each week, right? So that's the kind of metric we use. That would mean today in Dublin, in an affordable home, so not a subsidised social home, because social housing is subsidised. It requires other sources of money beyond the rent to sustain it, even just at a non-profit basis. Um, it, it would mean you would need rents for one, twos and three beds, seven, eight and nine hundred euros. That's your kind of ballpark in Dublin and then lower uh, outside of that. Compare that to market rents in Dublin at the moment, one bed, 1,500 minimum, two bed, 2,000 to 2,200, uh, and three beds are pushing up to 2,500 plus, right? So that's, the, that's your ballpark. Outside of Dublin, prices are a bit different, but uh, they're catching up. For affordable purchase housing, there's an additional metric, I suppose. And for me, it's about the affordability in terms of that 30%. But it's also about, and this speaks to your question, right?